you. It's my great pleasure to have us um, with us today, Professor Roddenbush, and the screen is all yours. Oh, thanks very much, Kaz, and thanks to uh, Selkan and um, Carolee Takach and to the entire IAS group. I think it's a fantastic idea to bring people together from all over the world. <laughs> uh, that, that something that we can do with uh, Zoom and so forth. It's it's uh, uh, it's it's really a treat to be here. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about uh, social experimentation in general, but really uh, my specialty area is in education. So a lot of my uh, most my my two examples are primarily educational. Um, I want to say that I've been uh, there's been a huge move toward um, uh, randomized trials in education and other areas of social research in the United States. I'm interested in your thoughts about whether wherever you are, this is this is also happening. But I've been a big fan of this development, and um, but I'm a little bit um, critical of uh, how sort of what might be called the dominant paradigm of how people have uh, conceived and analyzed the data from these studies. And the, the work I'm going to be talking about today draws uh, quite heavily from the two papers that you can see. My my colleague, uh, Takako Nomi, at, uh, uh, at uh, St. Louis University, I want to especially uh, mention her name because uh, the, the the main application that I'm going to talk about is double dose algebra, um, uh, it, 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 a reform of high school algebra to try to benefit um, disadvantaged kids in the United States and in, in Chicago actually. And then the other the other sort of more broadly methodological paper is in the Annual Review of Statistics uh, with Dan Schwartz, who is a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard in biostatistics. Um, so, so as I mentioned, and actually, um, it, it, it all started here in terms of educational experiments in 2002. Congress passed something called the Education Sciences uh, Reform Act, uh, based on uh, the actually the George W. Bush administration had had brought in. Um, Russ Whitehurst and others who were actually first-rate researchers who were very critical of the fact that in in the, our country there's a massive private industry selling products to educators. Rarely do we have any evidence suggesting that these are good things, and and so there's a lot of sort of old old-time um, huckster behavior, people selling stuff. Uh, that really has never been tested, and a lot of the stuff is not well conceived, and that was kind of the idea behind it. But ever since 2002, there have been hundreds of large-scale randomized trials in education in the United States, and and this mirrors also um, an increase in randomized trials in, in neighborhood research and in uh, mental health um, in, in economics and in, 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 in real increase in these randomized uh, control trials. Um, in I must say that in education in the US prior to 2002, it was extremely rare to see a randomized trial. So it was really a dramatic change. Um, and uh, the I'm gonna kind of focus on the dominant, what's become kind of a dominant paradigm for um, conceiving and analyzing these studies and essentially say that this paradigm has been sort of borrowed from medicine, clinical trials in medicine, also in um, sort of causal in inference in econometrics. Um, and very little sociological thinking has, has had an effect on this. And I think it's really been a shame because I think there's a tremendous amount that we can learn from these trials. Um, and I think sociology has a, a, a great deal to contribute. Um, so I'm gonna lay out an alternative way of thinking about these trials from more of a sociological perspective. Um, and it's a pretty dramatic change in really how this would um, the work, this work would unfold. So my central argument is that when we try to um, 
change things on the ground. Like it, schooling is a great example. When we try to improve teaching or um, improve uh, the functioning of schools, um, the first thing that we see is, and, and by the way, and this, this occurs in other social areas, so I'm going to kind of generalize it and say is the effect of the intervention depends on agents. So in schools, we're talking primarily about teachers. They have to enact the intervention. These agents, and in other areas, the agents could be social workers or police or um, physicians, right? But whatever is going to happen on the ground is going to happen because of the actions of these agents. I guess they've been called street level bureaucrats in past research. But these agents tend to be very heterogeneous, heterogeneous in their skill, their beliefs, um, and, uh, and their commitment. Um, and in education in particular, teachers have enormous autonomy in the United States. We don't have a national curriculum. We have locally governed schools. Teachers you shut the classroom door and basically mostly do whatever they think they should do. Um, so there's this heterogeneity of the agents upon whom we rely for the efficacy of any new trial, okay? And these agents are operating in or in, in general in organizational settings, well, in, in education, in schools, um, could be mental health centers, could be neighborhoods, could be uh, hospitals, right? But um, in education, um, these schools and school districts that they operate in, and particularly in the United States, are themselves enormously heterogeneous. We have local control. We have local funding to control and governance of schools. So schools are able to um, operate quite independently. And, um, and, of, and of course, it goes without saying that the, the clients uh, in education, the kids really that were who's, who's we're trying who's learning we're trying to assist are themselves very very heterogeneous um and i would say this also extends to other domains uh patients uh, mental health patients um uh neighborhood residents uh we have um you know a very uh segmented society based on social class and race um uh, uh schools have very different uh serve very different uh, subsets of kids and these three four sources of heterogeneity are linked. Okay, so you might, you know, and we often say in sociology that that there's a that in a in a competitive market that organizations um, become isomorphic, meaning they start looking more and more alike because they're all in this competitive market. And this there's some truth to that uh, in education. We see people taking up similar. Um, similar new ideas, new trends. Um, um, but in another way, what really happens is that the people who have to teach the kids and the schools in which they operate actually have to adapt to some substantial degree to the variability of the population they serve. For one thing, the subpopulations in the U.S. have very different levels of academic skill so you have to shape your your actions to the level of skill of the people that you're um that you're teaching partly because this is partly because schooling is so in, so ineffective it's also because of uh resource deprivation of large numbers of people um so we have these we have very uh widely varied subpopulations and and to make any um any sense out of a new intervention, it has to be adapted uh, by these uh, local actors. Uh, so the whole idea is that action is local. The interpret the the intervention may have a label that it, that's shared across sites, but the the actual um, meaning of the organization and the lives of the participants is local. And next, we can say. I'll argue that um, that sharply defined causal effects are also um, local. They arise locally. So the first example that I'm going to talk about is the National Head Start Impact Study. 
um, in which we have over 300 sites. Uh, this is preschool, a preschool intervention for low-income children. 300 sites, uh, and there's a random assignment of of uh, families who wish to be in Head Start. To they, they win a lottery, they get into they get into Head Start. The um, these sites are enormously different in what they actually do. I mean, they share the Head Start label, and they ha it's really Head Start is nothing but it's a funding stream that people use in a variety of different ways. They have these sites have different curricula. They have different, ver widely varying skills of the local staff. They serve extremely different people in it, from the mountains of At Appalachia to the, to the um, you know to the uh, inner city uh, ghettos of Chicago, uh, just widely varied areas. So, um, I'm going to argue later that um, well, now actually <laughs> that uh, the actual intervention that we see on the ground is site specific and there's random assignment within each of these sites we actually have therefore a, a fleet of over 300 <laughs> highly varied um uh, uh interventions we have 300 it's like a meta-analysis of 300 studies independently in these different local areas right so that's a very locally defined causal effect 300 causal effects and what I'm saying is that the paradigm that we've borrowed from medicine and from economics that don't recognize the locally generated nature of these of these effects. That when I say sharply defined, I mean locally. If you're in one of these sites, you can actually see what kids are getting compared to what the alternative is. But but on a national level, the only thing they really have in common is the label head start and the funding that goes with it. Um, and so what I'm going to say is that in these kinds of situations, the key estimate, that is, and an estimate is the quantity that we're trying to and we're, we're trying to estimate with our statistics, the sometimes called just the parameter. But here I'm going to argue that the key parameter is not the, is not simply the average causal effect in the population, but rather the distribution of these locally defined causal effects, okay? This is a kind of a radical departure from, um, from what is the dominant paradigm. So let me say a little bit more about the dominant paradigm. But please, uh, are we getting any any questions in the chat already? No. All right. Well, that's fine. I'll just let me know when you want to ask one. So, um, so the dominant paradigm. So I'm going to talk about the tyranny of the ATE, the average treatment effect. And by, by that, I mean that um, the focus in so many studies is um, what is the average impact of an intervention defined on a broad population and education of, it would be, of students, okay? Like in Head Start, it would be what's the, what's the average effect of spending money, essentially, uh, of, the, of the funding stream that is known as Head Start, and that tends to be the key focus. Um, of course, we know that looking only at the mean can cover up tremendous uh, heterogeneity and can actually be very misleading if there's a small average treatment effect, let's say, but highly statistically significant. But if substantial number of children are being harmed or are, are um, uh, and I'm not saying that's happening in Head Start, but if it were true, um, then uh, it, it could be very misleading. Um, but what's happening on the ground is not well described by the ATE. No one, it may be that no single, there's nobody who experiences that size of an effect. It's just an aggregation over heterogeneity. Um, I'm not saying it's irrelevant. I think it's useful. Policymakers need to know what that is. I'm not, I'm not against it, but, it, but to stop there really impoverishes the research and then following the ATE, so, so the standard response to, to the ATE, well, we have to look for heterogeneity. And um, I'm going to characterize uh, this as uh, subgroup analysis. And it really has become a little ritualistic. Um, so we have the average effect of a new intervention. Does it, does it differ for boys and girls? Does it differ for um as a function of race or ethnicity, does it de depend on the social class of the student? So we've got 
three moderator variables. And so we're going to see what's the average effect within three sub three within subgroups. I mean, it could be more than that, but that's a very standard sort of thing. Um, there's some the subgroup analysis has been um, criticized for statistical reasons. Um, sometimes the subgroups might be picked rather opportunistically based on p values, right? So there's the idea that maybe we're p hacking and we're just picking the subgroups that are interesting. Maybe we'll have a, a null finding overall and we'll try to find a subgroup where there's a positive effect, that sort of thing. Um, uh, and uh, the other and second criticism is that uh, the ch the choice of subgroups is is a function of the subjectivity of the investigator. Some, although there's a commonality, but different people could conceive of different um, subgroups. So there's 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 it's the analysis therefore doesn't depend entirely on random assignment. It depends partly on the on the uh, investigator's um, uh, preferences. Now, by the way, I'm I'm all for modeling, post-treatment modeling, and and I'm not saying we should run, rely totally on randomization, but we should squeeze as much as we can out of randomization. We just try to get more out of it, and and that would help us frame any more um, theoretically driven subgroup analysis we might want to do. But there's actually another aspect of subgroup analysis that really bothers me even more than those statistical critiques, and that is. So you have this idea, well, the treatment works, the treatment works well for this subgroup. It works well for blacks, not whites, or it works well for girls, not boys, boys, not girls. Um, it, the treatment. And I think that's, it conjures up the idea that people are responding to the same version of the treatment, but that's not what's really happening on the ground. These different subgroups are really experiencing different versions of the treatment that have been adapted in certain ways, either um, possibly nicely adapted or maladapted <laughs> to the, the subjects that are being served. So, so the idea that we have uh, different subgroups, each of whom is responding different to the, differently to the same treatment, puts the focus on individualism, individual effects to a common treatment. That's not really what's going on. The treatment, the treatment is um, co-generated within organizational settings by the agents that I mentioned, the teachers and the students themselves. Okay. So it varies from site to site, depending in part on the demographic composition of who's in that site. So I'm going to offer an alternative multi-level framework um, for these trials. So here's the outline of the talk from now on. I'm going to briefly mention the counterfactual account of causality, which I suspect many of you or maybe all of you are familiar with. I'll do that very briefly. Um, but I want to emphasize um, the, con the conventional implementation of this and what I'm going to call the routine reliance on S on the stable unit treatment value assumption of Donald Rubin. Well, it's a it's a brilliant uh, insight that Rubin had. Um, I'll, I'll define that better. But there's um, it, it's a simplifying assumption that is that people mention and they say they're assuming it, but they don't critically evaluate whether the assumption really makes any sense in terms of the social world that we're actually looking at. And I'm saying a lot of times, it doesn't make sense. So, um, uh, and in its place, I'm going to offer a, a sort of a relaxation of this assumption that allows locally defined versions of a treatment um, and possibly social spillover effects. Um, and with two cases, very briefly, I'll talk about the National Head Start Impact Study, which is a fleet of randomized trials. Um, and uh, it's just a nice, simple example of a, of a locally defined a treatment, very simple one. And then I'm going to spend more time on double dose algebra, which I think really, um, really illustrates the argument uh, very well, um, because it turns out that, you know, what you're doing is um, you are... Uh, um, increasing the time of instruction for kids who are behind. That's the whole treatment. But the, rea the reality is that school organization plays a decisive role 
Uh, and I, and it's something that I don't think you'd see unless you were really thinking more sociologically and more locally about what's going on. Um, and then I'll have some conclusions um, uh, beyond the ATE, looking at optimal local treatment regimes, trying to optimize those regimes for the variability and the kinds of people that are ser that are served. That's the idea. Um, instead of just trying to push the average treatment effect, make it bigger, we're optimally um, uh, uh, optimize these local effects. Okay, so that's the basic uh, outline. All right, so in counterfactual account of causality um, in st statistics, um, often called the Rubin model, although it has its roots in back going back to Neyman, and uh, certainly many others have contributed. But the idea is that um, uh, each participant in a causal study has potential outcomes uh, under alternative uh, treatment assignments. Um, and we only are going to see the outcome that uh, that uh, given the what 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 the experience that person actually has. But the it's a theory says that I could respond differently depending on which treatment I would get, and that there are person specific causal effects that we want to define. And then from then on, we're going to build, we're going to use that sort of uh, fundamental individualistic sort of definition of a causal effect and build on that to talk about average causal effects. So sort of. um, that's pretty much dominating so, uh, statistics and, and certainly its application in social science and certainly in education. And I'm not going to quarrel with this, actually. I'm using the same paradigm. Um, um, if my colleague James Heckman were here, he would immediately uh, yell at me for giving Ruben all the credit um, because um, the idea that there are alternative courses of action, each of which has a potential outcome, is just built into economics. I mean, people people contemplate alternative courses of action. They have preferences. Um, there are utility functions, right? That you're, and and the rational agent would would sort of try to maximize the utility by choosing a, a course of action. But of course, the rational choice model has come under criticism. But still, the idea that um, there are alternative courses of action with different outcomes and benefits and costs is uh, fundamental in economics. So it's not really a new idea, um, and it's come to dominate. Uh, certainly that idea thought, dominate causal thinking and economics as well. Um, so the basic idea, so here's an example. Oh, no, actually, no, sorry. sorry. Uh, now, I'm <laughs> turning my attention rather. Here is how this, this sort of uh, modern puzzle model uh, has become routinized. Uh, okay, this is going to, I'm going to sort of critique this in a way. So why, so... Let's let's imagine that there's uh, that we have a new drug and we're trying to see whether it reduces depression. And so, Y I one would be the response of patient I, if assigned to this new treatment, this new drug. Um, y I zero would be the outcome that that same patient would have would uh, display if assigned to whatever the control group is, could be a conventional drug, could be no drug, could be business as usual, right? And so then um, there's a there's a person-specific causal effect, B sub I, which is simply the difference between YI1 and YI0. Here I'm assuming that Y is a sort of a continuously measured, uh, some measure of well-being that we're trying to improve, uh, just to keep it simple. Um, and then, um, so so every every person um, possesses a BI, but we'll never see it <laughs> because if I'm a, if a, if the patient is assigned to the treatment, we'll see YI one, but we won't see YI zero, right? And similarly, if they're assigned to control, we see YI zero, but not YI one. So there's a missing data problem here, right? So we'll never compute the person specific causal effect, but we can estimate its average over a population or a subpopulation, its expectation, calling it the ATE beta, um, under assumptions, right? 
And um, there's, in any particular study, there's various assumptions, but one assumption that's pretty much always, did I say what it is? Yeah, no, I didn't. Uh, it's pretty much always made is that your potential outcomes, YI1 and YI0, don't predict your treatment assignment, okay? So, you know, whereas in economics, we might say a rational agent would pick the treatment that's optimal, um, depending on the benefit and cost. But um, in uh, the assumption is going to be that um, that there is no that no no uh, that there's an in the, that the potential outcomes are independent of treatment group assignment. Of course, this is guaranteed. This is the beauty of the random assignment: is that um, that that assumption. If everybody has a probability of 0.5 or 0.7 or whatever it is, if everybody has a known probability um, of um, of being assigned to the treatment, then obviously their potential outcomes are not determining which treatment they get. It's being decided randomly. So then we we achieve that assumption, and we can justify that expectation. That's the argument. And then there's an empirical model that comes from this. So YI would be an observed outcome, which it, Z is an indicator of which treatment you're assigned to. So if Z is one, we're going to see YI one. If Z is zero, we're going to see YI zero. So we can write we can we can write the observed outcome this way. Um, the, we can write we can rewrite this and say the observed outcome is the is the control outcome plus plus the uh, treatment indicator Z times the causal effect. And this is what, what Heckman would call the random coefficient model. So BI would be a person-specific random effect of um, of uh, uh, of receiving the treatment. Again, it's not observable. Uh, but um, And then we, but we can easily just rewrite this as a simple linear model where mu O is the average control group, uh, is control group mean, um, beta is the average causal effect, and epsilon absorbs um, the uh, the differences between yi zero and mu zero, and between bi and and beta. Okay, so it's kind of straightforward. Now we do we do ordinarily squares regression. We get beta, and that's the ATE. I mean, you can put in covariates, you can do different things, but they, <laughs> you know, this is a simplified example, but this is sort of the dominant paradigm. Okay. Okay, so now let's talk about this stable unit treatment value assumption, uh, Donald Rubin, 1986. And it has two parts. The first part says that each patient has two potential outcomes. Um, um, and, and, and this implies uh, two things. Um, uh, that uh, there's only one version of each treatment. In other words, um, uh, because if there were different versions of the treatment, you know, I might have more than two potential outcomes. Um, um, or different patients might have different sets of pot potential outcomes, which would be kind of a big complicating problem. And then the other one is no interference between units. So the idea is that the treatment is that the, my response to the new drug is not affected by the treatment assignment of other people. Okay. And and you know you can imagine if um, if my if, if my spouse and I are both in the study and my spouse gets the new treatment, it's really effective. Maybe it would really help me, right? <laughs> Even though I didn't get it. But um, the assumption is that people are responding independently, right? Um, and so the the entailments of the uh, stable unit treatment value assumption in our case of the drug trial here would be that the actual physician that you that prescribes the drug the hospital in which um you are operating and the other patients have no effect on your potential outcomes so the organization there's no organizational effect there's no effect of the agent i.e the, the the physician nor is there any spillover between other patients and you so we can formalize it, and this is routinely applied. People just say, I'm assuming this, often not, not critically evaluating it. So we can formalize this assumption by rewriting the model sort of more uh, formally, saying it may be, you know, more generally, that, that 
if I am person I, my potential outcome could, could depend on ZI. That's my own treatment assignment. All right. Did I get the drug or not? But it could depend on the treatment assignment of everybody else in the study. In principle, right? It could depend on the physician, P, and it could depend on the hospital. In theory, those things could happen. But what we're saying is all of, you know, the, the P, the, the physician, the hospital, and all of the other people are ignorable. So what we, we only have to worry about the potential outcome under Z equals one or zero. So that's the assumption that, that people are making. Um, and, and it might be, you know, it could be in some cases um, sort of very uh, plausible. I mean, to say there's only, like you could say, well, there's is there only one version of the treatment? Well, the chemical composition of the drug doesn't change. Everybody has exactly the same drug, we hope, we assume. Um, although... Um, yeah, although uh, one might argue that, and, and, and the physician doesn't matter, although one could argue that physicians vary in how effective they are in convincing their uh, patients to um, comply, um, uh, et cetera. Hospitals might, um, it might be easier in some hospitals than others to fill a prescription, right? I mean, so there are possible ways that you could see this being false, but it's it seems yeah probably reasonable in a lot of studies. But how does this work out? And if we just import this paradigm whole hog into education, like what happens? Like what you know what what um, does this really work? And so uh, the, we, instead of physicians, we have teachers who are enacting. Let's say we have an instructional reform. You have to teach in a new way, um, um, a smaller class size, or you have a new curriculum, or you have um, some other sort of uh, professional development that you're supposed to be practicing on your students. Whatever the treatment is, the teachers have to enact it uh, in classrooms. And to me, this kind of apply, implies uh, multiple versions of the treatment. That is, as a student, the version of the treatment you're going to get is going to be a function of who, who your teacher is. Um, and the treatment assignment of one's peers may affect one's own potential outcomes. So uh, Guang Mei Hong and I have a paper on this, um, uh, looking at the effect of uh, grade retention, kids, kids being held back in kindergarten. So you failed kindergarten, so you have to take it over again. This actually happens. Not on a huge scale, but it does happen. Um, uh, and uh, the most disadvantaged kids are the ones who are at risk of failing. It's... Uh, uh, disadvantage in multiple ways, um, in, if you read the article. Um, but uh, what we reasoned is that um, if we if we think about spillover effects, we, so think about the child who would never be retained. If you do a propensity score analysis, the child, their children who would never be retained, they're just doing fine and nobody's going to retain them a grade. Nevertheless, they could be affected if a large number of their peers were retained. In other words, you're being promoted to the next grade, but those kids who are having trouble, they're not in your classroom anymore because they're, they're, they're doing kindergarten over again. Or maybe if very, very few or zero kids are being retained, then those kids are in your classroom, so you have different peers, right? So, so that is an example of a potential spillover effect. And so we would, you know, the routine application of SUFA would fail in this case, right? Um, so Guang Lei Hong, who uh, the co-author in this uh, in her dissertation, um, said, uh, "Let's let's write out this this uh, you know the same sort of potential outcome, but um, uh, let's um, adapt it to education. So the, the potential outcome of student I depends potentially on the treatment assignment of other students, like whether you're retained or not, who your teacher is, and what school you're in. Te teacher being the agent." J, T being the agent, J is the organization. And so the idea is that um, your classmates, your teacher, and your school create a unique local environment in which the, in which the intervention occurs. And so in principle, within that local environment, there's a causal effect. And we have lots of reasons to suspect a priori 
that those causal effects are going to vary because people are getting different versions of the treatment and the people themselves are heterogeneous, right? Okay. Um, and so in this view, each participant possesses a single potential outcome within each possible treatment setting, but which treatment settings are going to be, you know, are going to be realized depends locally. So the causal effects are going to be local. And we're going to anticipate that these effects are going to vary. Uh, they're going to vary over settings. Now, one of the problems here with this alternative paradigm is that um, it's, it's really unworkable. <laughs> it's a big problem because if we take this seriously, your potential outcome could be perturbed by the change of the treatment assignment of any one person. And how are we actually going to do causal effects if the if if I have I would have like something like two to the n potential outcomes? Because there's if there's n people in the study, maybe more because there's also different teachers in different uh, hospital a uh, different. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, organizations. So um, we have to do something to simplify that. And uh, the people down at the bottom, Hong, Verbitsky, and then in our paper, also Hudgens and Haller, Hudgens and Haller in 2008, um, developed the idea that, well, let's try to summarize the treatment assignment of other people through a function, Z, um, some function of these treatment assignments. So in the grade retention study, it would be the fraction of your peers who are retained, or maybe just a one you can make it simple and say, Z, F of Z is a one if you're in a school where lots of people, kids are being retained, you know, zero if not, something very simple like that. So now you've got, now you've got something that's, it's, it's more manageable. You have your own, so your potential out outcome depends on your own treatment assignment. It depends on this function of your classmates' treatment assignment, and it depends on potentially the teacher, and I keep sorry if I change these letters, the teacher and the, um, the school. Okay, so the conclusion um, of this kind of part of the talk is that there's this conventional causal paradigm that's become routine, even I think in settings where it's, it's absolutely not plausible, where each uh, person has a single potential uh, outcome uh, under each uh, treatment and the treatments, and there's only one version of the treatment, right? Um, and then there's this alternative paradigm that I'm trying to construct, which are we, the group of people that I mentioned, um, uh, where uh, uh, there's potential outcomes within each treatment setting, um, you have peers, you have agents, you have organizations, and you know you need sociological theory to sort of make sense of like what do you expect to happen in these places. And then the estimate, the thing we really care about, is a distribution of treatment effects defined on a population of settings. So this is kind of a sociological idea that there's a population of settings, population of schools. It's not actually going to be a population of kids, if unless we find. Uh, we can estimate an average effect on, on a population of kids, but since we'd then be averaging over all of these different, this enormous heterogeneity um, and different kids from different backgrounds are getting different versions of the treatment. So it's very, very murky what's actually going on. So instead, we're going to say um, there's a, a, a sort of a fleet of uh, treatment effects emerging from these locally and in, from these settings, and we want to study the variability in those. That's the alternate paradigm. Okay. So the first case, National Impact Head, National Head Start Impact Study. See how how am I doing on time? I'm okay. Right. Uh, yeah, you have about 20, 30 minutes okay. to okay, talk, good. and then we still have yeah. time to any. Okay. Um, that's great. So this is, this is a brief example, but it's it's a nice, simple example. So um, uh, um, so this was a, a really interesting study back in 2010. There's a list, there exists a list of, you know, thousands and thousands of Head Start centers. These are local um, preschool settings, which are restricted to low-income kids. Okay, this is probably something that wouldn't happen in Sweden. We have these means-tested interventions, right? So we, that's kind of something we do, kind of 
if you look around the world and you see when people have um uh in different countries i've actually reviewed this research where um uh where there's universal uh access to um uh, preschool that's kind of the more the alternative version so we're just going to do this the government's all going to pay for it if you're if you're low income right um so there's so the idea was what they did was they took a, a sample of about 370 uh of these uh head start centers and they advertised locally these head start centers by the, by the way don't have enough money to accommodate everybody so what they did is um uh they held a lottery it's, if you want your child to be in head start apply and then there was a lottery uh and so people were randomly assigned to get an offer to be in head start or not so which created three, 370 randomized trials many little trials some of the many of unfortunately many of the sample sizes in the, are very very small in this study but there's some larger ones so it's kind of it's a little bit um tricky to analyze but still in principle this huge fleet of independent randomized trials right um okay so uh uh yeah so i said this okay so it, it has this kind of a of a look to it. You've got um, in each center there's an there's a, a random assignment to an experimental or a control group, uh, and uh, and what we see is we get that ATT of 0 0.20, right? 0 0.20 standard deviation. So the average effect of attending Head Start on your reading, this is your reading outcome, is twenty percent of a standard deviation, which is a uh, very substantial. Uh, you you know we we've lowered our our uh, our standards. We now think that's a big effect. We used to think it's a small effect, but we've had so many null findings that we were happy to see such a thing. Um, it is. It's a substantial effect. It's it's probably something like, you know, uh, half a year of kids learning. So it's it's not trivial at all. Um, but but the variance of the treatment is 0.04 squared. So um, so this is and so uh, that turns out to be quite a large uh, variance component, meaning that there's a lot of heterogeneity across the setting. So, so here's the way our model would set it up. So now we're not going to have any spillover. We're not going to have spillover because if you're assigned a Head Start, all of your classmates are assigned a Head Start. It's not like there's some people who are assigned and not. So we're not going to worry about spillover. So we're going to have a much more simple model. We're going to say that your your potential outcome if assigned to treatment is yi of one j. So it's it's um, it's one means you're assigned a head start and j is um in in setting j so um and then versus yi zero which is if you're assigned to control in that same site in that same local area uh and what we're saying is the version of the treatment you're going to experience is going to be different in different settings it's amazing how different these um Head Start centers are. They have completely different curricula. They, there's a battle of what curriculum is correct going on in the U.S. And some of them have the one, you know, they have what's called creative curriculum is the probably 70, maybe 60 percent. But then there's high scope, there's DISTAR, more direct instruction, not so conceptual. There's a, there's this huge disagreement. And these and these start centers are getting all of these different curricula. They're also being taught by very different kinds of um, uh, teachers who have very highly varied background, different, they have different class sizes. There's just an, an inordinate number of ways in which these centers vary. So, um, so uh, what we're gonna say is that BIJ is the person-specific causal effect. Um, it's gonna look a little bit like it's going to look very much like the dominant paradigm, except we're doing it within each setting. So we have YIJ, the the the, out, the observed outcome of student I and in, in child I in, in in setting J is either going to be Y1J or Y0J, depending on your treatment assignment. And then we're going to um, we're going to translate this into sort of a least squares model. But this is a model that exists within each local setting. Okay, it's a hierarchical linear model, which is the thing that I often do. And uh, and what we're saying is that um, and and the way I've come to think about this stuff. Oh, it looks like I forgot a parenthesis here. But um, but oh, I should say that the the error has potentially 
uh, different variants for the treatment of control group. Um, and it, 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 we have a mo we need a model for the variants of, of, of this uh, epsilon within each is so a within site variance. Uh, I have come. Much. Yeah, sure. Can I interrupt? Um, you said this, there are no spillovers, but I guess some of the spillovers could be from the treated to the untreated, right? Well, I, you know, you could say, well, if they're um, in the same neighborhood or something like that, um, that, that, but they wouldn't happen in, in, you know, in the Head Start, like all the kids in Head Start are in Head Start. So at least on a daily basis, and they're, they're interacting with other kids who've been assigned to Head Start. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just thinking about smaller communities where, you know, oh, all, yeah. all the kids yeah. know each other and everybody knows yes. who's in Head Start and got the lottery, won the lottery and who's not. Yes. No, absolutely. This, yeah, I totally agree. There could be spillover effects. I shouldn't have been. I think I was guilty of the sin that I'm criticizing when I said that. Sorry. About <laughs> okay. <that. laughs> but, you know, it's at least somewhat plausible to at least, whereas in Grade in grade retention, you're sitting in the classroom with the kids who who would have been who would have been literally in the same classroom every single day, who, who would have been retained or would not have been retained. So the spillovers there are, are in your face. Here it's a little bit more subtle. Okay, you could make the argument, and sometimes you know it gets hard to sort of specify a, a potential outcome when the when you don't have any information on how that that process actually works. Like who do they really know and so forth. You know, if we knew had some social network data, we could do something with it, right? So yeah, so we do have to make some compromises. That's a great, that's a really great point. Um, but so we're we're just kind of keeping it simple here. Just uh, we so we're kind of saying yes, there are alternative versions of the treatment in that sense that we were, the standard soup it doesn't doesn't um, hold. But we're 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 allowing we're we're sort of um, um, pretending or at least assuming that the spillover effects are. I guess you could say weak if they do exist. You know, we could say that, um, and we can. That's subject to crit that's subject to criticism, and I'm glad you you criticized it. But um, the way I've come to think about these models now for these, I, I tend to now think of you know the economists like fixed effects models, and I, I I sort of like the idea of um, just for this example of having a fixed intercept, um, but a randomly varying treatment effect, and that's crucial. It makes a huge difference, and it makes it can make a big difference in even how you estimate the ATE. You can get a very different estimate if you use the fixed effects model, which assumes a constant treatment effect, is not a good way of enter of estimating the center of the distribution of effects defined on sites. It's much more oriented toward the average treatment effect on the population of kids. Okay, so but we're doing something a little different here. So we're having a heterogeneous treatment effect defined on centers, and, and we're saying there's a population of centers. And this is the beta, the gamma is the central tendency of that. The tau squared is the is the variance. Okay. We don't have normality is not a big issue here. I'm so, I'm assuming normality for convenience. It, uh, the the uh, the normal theory estimating equations uh, don't really depend much on normality. We could talk about that. Um and here's here's a kind of display of of what these treatment effects look like. Use these are empirical Bayes estimates for you guys who know about empirical Bayes. These are these are because the center many many of the sites are very small. Um, the the least squares estimates by site are, have huge noise, um, and by shrinking those in a in a sort of principled way, we get this kind of uh, distribution of these effects. Um, this is actually a little more condensed than the real distribution because it, of the shrinkage. But it, we can therefore estimate the impact of the head start in each and every setting, and this is the histogram of those. And you can see it's centered on point two. Um, but you can also see that uh, effects between zero and 0 0.4 are pretty plausible. So, you know, there's some sites that have bit, virtually no effect and 0.4 is a huge effect. So there's, you know, this is not surprising given the variability in these, in these treatments, there's just, you know, huge difference. These are huge differences in effect. Okay. So, so that's kind of our summary. Now, we would want to model these. Of course, we want to model these, but we want to establish this paradigm this this sort of estimate first we want to establish this because this just this everything i've said so far depends only on mainly just on random assignment and the, the version of the stable unit value assumption that i have which is you know different version of treatment but no spillover that's a key assumption the second key assumption is we're relying on random assignment to get these kinds of things and to get this kind of picture so we haven't really um we haven't really um 
brought in a theoretical sort of rationale about how curricula, how different aspects of the organization shape these things. And that's important, but let's get, let's figure out what it is we're trying to explain before we formulate the explanatory model. Okay. Or, or at least as a pre, not, we can formulate it earlier, but let's, as a prelude, let's see what can we squeeze out of randomization, out of random assignment. And I'm saying we can get a lot more than the ATE. And, and much more meaningful, we can get a distribution of locally defined treatment effects, okay? Okay, so now the case, this case is gonna take, uh, it's a little more complicated, uh, double dose algebra in Chicago. So the bat, now here's a really kind of something with a real sociological background to it, because, you know, going back to uh, the 50s uh, in, our, in our country, I don't know what it was like in Sweden or elsewhere where you guys were, but, uh, when I was in school in the late 50s, that shows how old I am, early 60s. Uh, uh, if you were in high school, you were a boy. You were probably put into a vocational track. You were put into, uh, you were going to be a plumber or a carpenter or you are going to be, you know. And, and then if you were a girl, you were put into the general track, which in a kind of you would be learning housekeeping and you're learning how to cook and so and stuff but you're also learning how to type because maybe you're going to get a clerical job and then a very small fraction of kids would actually be put into something called the academic track and uh, of course this came under um I, that's what i'm saying here this came under a lot of uh, criticism um uh, by the way this is a nice quote Soroka, and at the present moment, it is certain that the school, while being a training and educational institution, is at the same time a piece of social machinery which tests the abilities of the individuals, which sifts them, selects them, and decides their prospective social position. Okay. So, this idea that the school is this sort of sorting mechanism, right? Um, uh, and within that, uh, so, um, uh, uh, that evolved. Okay, we don't, let me see if I say anything about that. Um, okay, uh, sorry. Uh, let me let me just say that in that sort of uh, tracking system, that uh, whether you took algebra, um, and then then it was in grade nine, but whether you took algebra was a key indicator of which track you were. In. If you're in the academic track, you're going to take algebra, you would take geometry, you know, trigonometry, and so forth. Math, in other words, was the really the, the key indicator. Um, if you're taking no algebra and you're just taking studying arithmetic, sort of, you know, that means you're not college bound in those days, right? Oh, there was a huge debate about is tracking good or bad. There were um, people like Davis and Moore and Parsons said, yeah, it's functional. It's functional to have this system and it reflects differences in skills and interests. And, you know, it allocates people uh, rationally into these nice industrial society that we used to have. I didn't think it was not, not that it was really that nice. Uh, other people said it was not good, you know, because all we're doing is reproducing social class inequality. You know? So um, there, there, there became then in our country, a big movement against Tracking and it had two sources. Um, one source was uh, we had the civil rights movement. We had uh, a progressive movement that said we are systematically robbing low income and minority kids of having a good future. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, and also. The labor market's changing, and a lot of these skills that we're training people for are, you know, there aren't, aren't many jobs for these people anymore, actually. Yeah, so um, so what we moved toward was this idea of academics for all, and that's the background of, of Double Dose. Um, the first version of this in Chicago was called Algebra for All. So what we found, though, by just putting kids who are low skill into algebra, algebra classes, it didn't help. Those kids did not do well, and the high skill kids suffered. Now, this let's think about who these high skill kids are. You'll see in a moment. We're talking about ninety percent uh, African American and Hispanic kids. We're talking about low income. These are all low income kids. So these are high skill, low income kids, and they're suffering. This isn't a good thing. So this anti tracking movement is generating some not so good results. Okay, even you know. The original tracking system was bad enough, and now we're getting something that maybe is 
really bad too. So here, uh, here comes you know the big solution: double dose algebra. We're going to uh, give two periods of math if you're low skill. One class is going to be a regular algebra class. The other one is going to be a remedial remedial class where you can catch up. Uh, but if you're a high skill kid, we're just going to give you the one the one period. So the double dose is going to be a way of creating a equality and making algebra for all work. Right. We're going to stick to the idea that everybody's going to get academic instruction, but we're going to give it, we're going to give kids more time. And it's a regression discontinuity. This is that design. This is not randomized, but it's the closest thing we have to a randomized study, it's argued, um, uh, without doing a random assignment. So we've got a data set here, 33,000 kids in 67 neighborhood schools in Chicago. Um, as you can see, 55% African-American, 35% uh, uh, Hispanic, only 7% white. This is the city. These are neighbor, the 67 neighborhood high schools. There are other high schools that you have to pass a test to get into, just a few, and they have more white students. Um, uh, and... Uh, um, uh, The, grad, the high school graduation rate prior to this had been only 60%. And the probability of having a four-year college degree for these kids is only 11%. So we're talking about a very disadvantaged sample, virtually all low-income kids. So here's the regression discontinuity. So if you so they gave a test in in uh, at, at prior just prior to going to high school. High school starts in grade nine. So these kids are about 15, okay, 16. 15, basically. Um, and if you score below the median on this test, you're assigned to double dose. And what's on the, whoops, what's on the, what's on the vertical axis here is the enrollment rate. And we can see that the kids who are below the median have, um, this is a, the, on the X axis is there, is the, the pretest score. It's called the running variable in, in a regression discontinuity. The the, um, the fraction of kids who take double doses on the y-axis, you can see not everybody assigned to double dose takes it, but a vast majority do. And there's a huge discontinuity at the cut point such that if you scored above the cut point, the probability of taking double dose is not zero, but it's very small. Okay, so this is sometimes called a fuzzy RDD. It's not a perfect regression discontinuity, but it's it's a it's a regression discontinuity in which there's a very strong um, effect of the cut point on on what you get. And so the argument here is that right around the 50th percentile, it's as if people are being randomly assigned to double dose. That's the beauty of the the beauty of the RDD is that in the neighborhood of the cut point, it's as if randomized. The, the downside, of course, and this is going to be getting into my local effects uh, argument, is that the conclusions you reach only apply to median skill kids. The kids who are far from the cut point are not, you're not, they're not contributing to, um, you don't know anything about the effect of double dose, like these kids down here. We have a new study where we're studying these kids down here. I may have a chance to mention that. Okay, so that's the situation. Um, the, the causal model, this is the routine conventional paradigm, says that scoring below the cut point affects whether you take double dose, which affects algebra learning. It's not possible. There's no way in which scoring below the cut point can affect your algebra learning except through double dose. This is called a an exclusion restriction. The cut point Scoring below the cut point is an instrumental variable that identifies the effect of taking double dose algebra on algebra learning. This is all the routine sort of thing. I don't know if this looks familiar to you guys, but this is very familiar now in, in, in our causal effects in the uh, U.S. Um, and, um, and, and we get some, um, some, some effect, you know, applying this, we get some effects on test scores um, and, and, uh, uh, 
and and other outcomes. Um, and and here's here's the 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 kind of ordinary least squares model. It's called a local linear model. Um, essentially, it says that your outcome um, has an intercept, um, sort of an effect of treatment assignment. Z is a one if you score below the cut, or um, and and um, a, a zero if not. Um, we're going to have the effect of uh, your pretest centered around the cut point, and we're going to have an interaction effect centered around the cut point. And as X approaches the cut point, the treatment effect is going to be beta star. This is the way. That, this is the machinery of how you do the uh, you do the RDD. Look at Imbens and uh, Imbens and Lemieux have this paper on how to do this stuff. And you you have to decide how wide your bandwidth is going to be around around the, the cut point when you do this. It's called the local linear. Uh, model. Now notice that in this model, schools do not, they're not exist. They don't exist. There are no schools in this model, right? Um, uh, and and that, that turns out to be a huge problem uh, with this model. Um, but what you get out of this model is you get the following kinds of things. Uh, and the nice thing about this study, and this was in uh, PNAS and a couple of years ago, um, I think the reference is on the front page. Um, is you look at so here we're looking at the running variable the the the, the, the pretest and now we're looking at semesters in college and we're seeing we're seeing a discontinuity at the cut point so we're seeing that the kids who had the double dose have more semesters in college but that only that happened in 03 but it didn't happen in 04 huge data sets so it's not like you know these are pretty reliable inferences um did you get any degree? There's an effect in 03, but not, not in 04. Um, and uh, did you get a four-year degree in effect in 03? And, and this effect actually almost looks like it goes the other way in 04. So there's a big question about why did 03 look different from 04? And we already had hints on, uh, on why this is, because we had already published a paper in 2016 showing that in 03, only some of the schools were capable of producing an effect. A bunch of other schools weren't. I mean, and that, and and here's kind of the key to that. This is like, this is where sociology comes in, and you got to start thinking about the school as the organization. These are just some effects that we see. I don't can skip over those. Um, uh, okay. Um, and here's. The graph on the right, I need to, to wrap up here. The graph on the right is is the is the big is the big hint here. Here is your math percentile score, and here is the average math achievement of your peers. And what we see is that scoring below the cut point not only increased the probability that you would take double dose, it also reduced. It, it put you in a classroom that had lower skilled peers on average. And that's because of how the schools as organizations implemented this. The interesting thing, and I'm going to go right to, cut right to the chase here, we can uh, wrap this up, is that in 03, if you look at the data, you can see that some schools complied more with others. There's some schools that basically just completely ignored the policy. They just didn't pay any attention to it. Meaning that like the probability, the, the effect of scoring below the cut point on taking double dose was like near zero. But most schools complied to some reasonably high degree. This is the compliance rate. Like the change in the probability of taking um, double dose at the cut point. And what we have, though, is that in a lot of schools, scoring, um, being assigned to double dose put you in a low-skilled classroom. You can think of how that works, right? Because you're assigned, to, you're assigned with all the other low-skilled kids, right? But in a bunch of schools, that didn't happen. And 
the positive treatment effects occur only in this quadrant. We knew that before, before we even looked at the O4 data. Can I can I ask really quick? Yeah. When yeah. You say you're put in a low skill classroom. Is that in the the double dose period or just in the algebra period? In the algebra period, yeah. Okay. Here we're only talking about the algebra course because the double dose periods are all pretty much lower skill kids. But the, it's the algebra class. Thank you for that. Great question. Um, the effects of double dose here are remarkable. Up in here, and what happened in 04 was that the the schools changed how they implemented. It, and there was some directives about how you're supposed to do this. Unfortunately, they were quite misguided because. It was almost not certain, but very likely that if you if you were put uh, into double dose, you had very low skill peers. Only a small number of schools did this. By the way, the effects of these small number of schools in this quadrant are almost the same as the small number of school of the schools in this quadrant. And this and this, so the effects are actually the same within quadrants in O three and O four. Um, I, I want to make one other point, which is we to check this. We found 11 schools that changed their policy between 03 and 04. That is, these are schools that in one of those two years, if you score below the cut point, you were put in classroom with low skill peers. But in the other year, you were put in classroom, you weren't, that you were, look, you were in classrooms that were more like yourself, more like median skill kids. These were just talking about median skill kids here. And the results were replicated within the same school we see that the effects are positive when they when they uh, didn't segregate you into a low skill classroom. So this kind of makes sense, and you know it's a, maybe another na knock on an overly uh, overly uh, ambitious uh, anti trapping. We're finding that kids do better when they're with in math when they're being taught with kids who have similar skill. We've been studying now the low skill kids using a different methodology and we're finding something very similar. I think it's just about time for me to um, to wrap this up. I, uh, the, the other, the, the, what I, I have some some tech technical things um, that I can talk about maybe in the in the Q and a, but but I think that really what I want to say here is that um, I think it's a dramatic example of where spillover effects become key and how people at the local level decide to implement the treatment becomes decisive in determining the effect. And from this, actually, the fact that they that they uh, administered that they that they administered this very differently actually is good for us because we can see something about an optimal treatment regime, which is not only increasing instructional time, but how you organize classroom composition, not to mention the content you teach. Okay, I'm going to stop because I want to have time for discussion. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for really presenting a great alternative to the 